that was the certification and licensure advisor to Credential Engine. But I can I say have it, I have it as your co-lead for Credential Engine. What do you call it? Uh, no, I'm not a co-lead. I'm chair of the certification life. I was advisor? a co-leader. How about yeah, advisor? Advisory group. I'm, advisor? I'm chair of the li certification licensure advisory group. I'm looking for short. Flag. Advisor to. And for certification licensure. No, I was co-lead with CTI, the okay. Lumina grant that started it all. Sorry. Okay. That probably wasn't. Clear. Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to do short. Yeah. Okay. That, that's great. Okay. That's All right. We are going to get started again. So as we started this process, and as both governors mentioned when we began, this notion of credentials, the notion of using designations of degrees or workforce certifications is an opportunity for employers to engage and understand what skills and competencies young people have. In, in many ways, credentials, and as you'll hear from the panels, um, are the way to start to bundle the skills and competencies young people have so as they enter into the workforce. It's that shorthand that employers will say, I understand what you have, now you can demonstrate the success you have while you're on the job. What you'll have uh, an opportunity here in this conversation is the complexity of this field of credentials. And, and again, as I said at the beginning, when we talk about credentials, we're talking about it in the larger term. It's the traditional degrees, but it's also workforce relevant certifications. And those are most important because we don't count them well, we don't define them well, we don't understand them well oftentimes in terms of quality. And so what the colleagues up here will help us try to do is understand the complexity of us of the issues of credentials, start to see a path forward in terms of defining those that are most relevant to the workforce and employers, and help us start to understand the role of states and employers in Gesundheit. <laughs> in, <laughs> sorry. Best of friends once you've been on a panel with me. Um, so as we go through this, um, we will have the opportunity to engage in that opportunity uh, to, to see how we bring some clarity around credentials. I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by three individuals. Uh, Roy Swift, who's currently the executive, executive director of WorkCred, uh, was also the advisor for um, a new uh, organizational uh, called Credential Engines, has a long history in a number of different uh, opportunities in building credentials, uh, was with the military and, and was the, help me with the medical. Uh, civilian wise, it would have been chief of allied health for the army. So bring, dietetics physician assistant. brings a lot of experience with uh, credentials coming out of the military, but um, has developed a career in helping states think about this issue of credentials. Second will be uh, Christine Nero. Um, and uh, Christine is, uh, uh, leads the Washington, D.C. office for Professional Testing, Inc. Uh, has been a senior executive with that organization for a long time and works with states around um, bringing credentials to nonprofit management organizations and really helping organizations and states in the space of credentials in terms of understanding it, developing quality around it, and helping employers and the private se the public sector better understand the bridge that credentials can play. And third is Allie Bell, who is uh, a longtime educator as a director for HCM um, Strategists, um, and works with a lot of states through the Lumina Foundation and others uh, in the post-secondary side to think about the issue of credentials, so brings a wealth of experience around policy programs, both for indus industries, uh, to think about how credentials can play a bigger role around helping young people get access to the uh, workforce. So we're going to start with Roy and um, start with the question of, help us understand this field of credentials. It's complex. <laughs> Could be the, uh, the answer. Oh, I got the press. Yep. There. Oh, there we go. Oh. 
There we go. I have a credential. First of all, yeah, I have to de- <laughs> I have to develop competencies to, to do this uh, uh, kind of thing. We're starting uh, a mentoring program. Yeah, right, exactly. No remedial education. So anyway, um, I would say that competency-based credentials are a key. And when I use the word credential, we have a lot of terminology, and Christine's going to address that in great detail uh, in a few minutes. Uh, But when I'm using the word credential right now, degrees to badges. Sometimes degrees are included in that word credential. Sometimes it's not included in that. uh, 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 Credential, in many respects, is a garbage pen term. And uh, so uh, we're going to try to refine our terminology so that when we say something, everybody knows what we're talking about and what that means in regard to competencies. Uh, Because competencies credentials are the currency through which people's knowledge and skills are recognized in a highly dynamic 21st century labor market. They have the potential to expand opportunities for worker mobility and sometimes restrict mobility, unfortunately, and help employers find the skilled workers they need. Ideally, competency-based credentials signal readiness to work and readiness to learn, leading to improved career outcomes, regardless of the learner's previous experiences. Now, we've had a morning session where it was pretty clear cut. We have higher education, we have K through 12, and we have workforce investment and credentials. But the credentialing world is pretty complex. Whoop. And uh, there it is, uh, your spaghetti uh, uh, dinner for for tonight uh, uh, in in this regard. And, And one of the things that you can see is that education is one component But of course, the states are extremely involved in licensure, determining scopes of practice through legislative action, and developing license. But then sometimes the license is based on certifications. And where do most of the certifications come from? They come from professional societies. One of the issues that we need to start talking about is bringing the professional societies and associations into the dialogue. It's not just business and education. It's business, credentialing, professional societies who control scopes of practice and what people can do, as well as uh, uh, looking at the higher education system. And then we know also that we have connections. So we have the, I also need competency on pointing. <laughs> oh. Point it this way. Here we go. There we, oh, there we go. Um, so sometimes uh, students who enter educational programs think, well, if I get a Bachelor of Science in something, I can just go out and practice. Hmm, maybe not, because what happens in higher education may mean that there is a certification. That certification may be used for licensure purposes within the state. And so it's a very lockstep thing. You have to graduate from an accredited higher education uh, program then you must have a certification and the certification is used for state licensure purposes. So it gets very complex. We also get the federal government involved. Sometimes they define scopes of certain new occupations like in the Department of Energy, in cybersecurity with the Department of Defense. Uh, We have uh, various uh, uh, schemes in food protection And then we have states who say, not only should you have a food handler certificate, but it should be accredited by a certain organization also. So we have all of this complex interaction. Then we have something called the Federation of State Boards, which interacts with all of you in the states. Because federations like nursing, psychology, uh, veterinarians, 
there are uh, uh, all types of federations they are the people who create the examinations for licensure purposes, but they also are activacies for policy at the state level in regard how that licensure should be implemented in this regard. So you can see that this gets very, very complex. We haven't added apprenticeships, which I, I, I should be uh, adding to this. And then we have the boot camps that have sprung up. Uh, because they feel that education has failed in their ability to provide the specific uh, skills uh, that are needed. And of course, uh, uh, we also, we could put under the academic programs uh, K through 12, uh, because there's more and more of a uh, energy about why shouldn't we be giving industry credentials at, in the high school level because there are many entry level jobs in those areas that should be done. And yet most of this credentialing in the certification world is at the community college uh, level that they don't. And, and yet there is the great opportunity for the 30% dropout rate, shame on us in the United States of out of high school where that could be one of the things that could less, lessen this sort of uh, opportunity. So I just wanted to use my sort of five minute introduction here to talk about the complexity of the system. There are many people involved. So when you think about credentials in your state, you've got to think about all of these various agencies that are going to impact whether you're going to be successful or not, because they have a lot of power in this country uh, uh, to determine what kind of credentials are, are developed. And often, sometimes they will say, we're industry endorsed. Guess what? They maybe had three employers in the room when they created the credential. Thus, skills gap, because the validity of that credential was not developed in a proper manner. And therefore, one has to peel the onion when you say, I'm certified, I'm, I have a certificate, I have an academic degree, because no one knows what that means these days. And, that leads to Christine talking about terminology and quality. Great, so Christine, help us continue this notion of defining the problem because I think where Roy is starting with this beautiful picture is a <laughs> lot of actors are involved. It's, it's one of those everyone's responsible, no one's responsible issue of how do we define quality? How do we define match? So mm -hmm. help us kind of continue that down that path of sure. what are other challenges in defining this issue? Sure. Well, there, there are a lot, and uh, Richard asked us to, um, there we are. So this is like, welcome to my world slide. And this indeed is part of the problem. This is what puts a lot of people's hair on fire. When they start to look up credentials, they Google something innocent like certification and come up with a myriad of terms. Some are correct and accurate and others are not. The words are frequently used interchangeably, whereas in my world, um, there are definitions and there are parameters and there are specific usages for each and every one of these terms. And, and they all have a place in the world of credentialing. So our conversation earlier today, um, you know, talking about K-12 and higher education and some of those challenges um, and making that connection between high school and post-secondary education and a job, a real job. And we want to help expand that connection and that pathway by talking about credentialing in maybe a little different way from what you um, have been discussing it so far and how you may be thinking about it. Um, as Richard was saying, you know, credentials help to show what success looks like. And I think they also help to define success across a number of levels. So what we are frequently faced with when we're couching the problem is this. This is like, Imagine the worst intersection where you live, the biggest traffic jam. When you're looking at credentialing, if you don't know what to ask for, then how do you know what you're going to get? 
Or sometimes you ask for something you thought you understood, but you didn't actually get what you thought you were asking for because you really didn't know what you were asking for in the first place, and so it continues. And so um, I think our, our goal here is to help you navigate these types of, of uh, intersections in, in career thinking. So if you're thinking about people beyond uh, post-secondary, people who are already in a career, people who have to change jobs, how many times do people change jobs in a lifetime? What is there for them to show that they have the competencies, that they're qualified to do that job, that an employer knows what to look for, that a person paying money to earn a credential knows what they're paying for and what they're getting from it, and which road do you take, which on-ramp, if you're the regulator or if you're an employer or you're making a hiring decision or you're the person who simply wants a job, wants to change a career, wants to advance in a career. So we'll help you lay the foundation for this by talking about some um, definitions. So can you see this? All right. So the first one I want to talk about is certification. Um, We've already talked about certification already this morning. And in, in my world, uh, in certification, in building certification programs for both the public and the private sector, um, they're complex. They take some time. They take plenty of resources in some cases. Um, but let me just give you a few things to take away. One is they're job related. So the whole foundation of a professional certification program is based on the job and building the competencies and the knowledge and skills that are required to perform that job at the required level. And um, as you all know, uh, jobs are moving targets and so is certification. So what you're building today is going to be different a few years from now. Think of medical technology, think of IT. Uh, one of the examples I love to use is cybersecurity because 10 years ago we were barely talking about it. And then several certification programs in cybersecurity were developed. And now when you watch television, you can go and get a degree in cybersecurity. So there's a very good example, I think, where certification actually took the lead in building and in defining um, a job or a job category. There must be an assessment. You have to assess. Somebody has to show they've met the competence requirements. And there is an art and a science that, that goes into that that I won't discuss here. That's like several days of discussion, possibly. Um, the individual who's awarded the certification has to show over the period of time that it's awarded that they've kept up their skills, that they've maintained their competence. We call it continuing competence, continued competence. We call it recertification. Um, but you have to show. Uh, that you're still you're still competent in the area, and that too is going to be a moving target because that's got to keep up with where the job was going and where those skills are. And then, as an individual who earned that certification, you don't get to own it. The certification body that issues it actually owns it, and it's on loan to you um, with several conditions. One of it, which is maintaining it, and the other is you need to typically abide by a code of ethics or a standard of practice. And if you violate that, you can have it removed. And that's really, really unique um, in this kind of credentialing. Um, a certificate is another type. Did that one come up? Yep. And cer certificates can be based on um, knowledge. They can be issued based on skill. They are typically one and done. You can think about it as a course you took and you were issued a certificate, and this time you get to own it. Um, you can think of some continuing education that you may have done can be issued uh, in the form of a certificate, and it usually is not awarded with strings that are attached to it. We talked a little bit already about um, degrees, and um, I'm not going to really go into that. I want to take a minute um, and talk about something that I think is a fairly recent 
development in, in our industry called micro-credentials. So I let out by saying that certifications are kind of resource intensive. And there are often situations where an individual already in a job just needs to be able to show that they've got some skill associated with that job. It's not the full job, it's just like a skill area associated with it. And micro-credentials have evolved to address this. Um, the ones that we have worked on uh, have been uh, assessment-based. Um, they have measured competence. Um, they followed best practices in their development as we adapted it from our knowledge of how you develop a best practice certification program. But we can get them to market faster because they're a smaller unit, all right? And we've seen a lot of growth in this area. Um, the other area that uh, we've seen growth in is in badging, in digital badging, which permits an individual. So that person who's got that lovely soft skill and collaboration that we talked about earlier um, can actually show that digitally um, in their badging system. So you as an employer can see, wow, this person's done team building or collaboration. It could be a different type of skill. It could include something like a micro-credential or a certificate you earned, or it could even show your certification if you have one of those. So the badging enables the individual to display what they've earned and to continuously build on it. And then it enables somebody else to go in and take a look at what you've done. So if you haven't been poking around LinkedIn a lot lately, that's a good place to see how people are presenting well, their Christine, skills. Before, yeah. before you jump on that, I just want to, the point you made, um, and just want to make it explicit is where you have the sub bullets under certification. Mm -hmm. You don't start with assessment. You start with a body of knowledge that is agreed between educator and employer around what the certification is around or what the badge is around. So just yeah. making sure that that's explicit. Right. And that's a good point. Thank you, Richard. That's building the foundation. And we start that with a job task analysis that actually involves um, anybody who's going to be affected by that certification. So you would want job incumbents, you would want supervisors, you would want regulators. And here's where I see a really big opportunity for industry and for employers to have them at the table as well as subject matter experts in the school of real world, of reality. This is what we're really looking for. If you build something that's current and relevant, um, you're going to have a successful um, useful, I think valuable credential. So the last term I wanted to talk about today is accreditation. And I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with higher education accreditation or healthcare accreditation. So in the world of credentialing, there are accreditation bodies that accredit people who develop and administer both certification and certificate programs. So when you're looking, uh, you know, counseling your kids or looking for your next career move and you're looking up certification, uh, look, is it accredited? That is one indicator of quality. Um, there, I don't know where we are in the evolution of defining these kinds of standards for things like microcreds and badges. I, I hear talk going on that some standard will be developed. Um, they're still, you know, being, being explored, yeah. Um, but the ones that are very well defined are for certification bodies. So that's the American National Standards Institute, it, Institute administers in the US an ISO standard. It has a number, 17024. And then there's the equivalent in the United States of a trade association. Um, that administers the National Commission for Certifying Agencies. Then for certificate programs, there is an ASTM standard. It, it has a number, 2659, and that's the standard practice for certificate programs. And one of the reasons that, that this was developed was to really draw a line in the sand under the leadership of Dr. Roy Swift at the time, because we had all this credentialing confusion. So go back to that exploding head. When I thought I was paying for a certification, it really was a certificate. I didn't know any differently. And having the accreditation standards really helps to define you know this is what a certification program of quality looks like this is what a certificate program of quality looks like and i think that really is a service to consumers because 
you know, if you think that this is confusing, you're highly educated people in the business already, think of what it's like for somebody trying to retool in their career. So um, I, I could spend a lot more time um, talking about this, but we wanted to keep this just sort of very high level for you and sort of then make the connection to how is credentialing. Hello, there's one more slide in here. Whoops, sorry, Roy. There, there we are. The red umbrella, right? That person who is looking for the job, how is credentialing related to jobs and persons? And I think it's really important to know what it is that you are looking for. So if you're writing regulation, if you're designing a program, what is it that you need to look for? If you're making a hiring decision, how do you know somebody's qualified to do the job? Um, how do you know that the credential has any value? Is it accredited? Did it follow standards, et cetera? And so we see credentialing really fitting into the career pathway and the career development for people and is a really useful tool for where education leaves off. Something else can take over. Great. So, right. Allie, before I bring you into this conversation and start talking a little about the states, I do want to just follow up maybe Roy or Christina's we often talk in the field about how fast jobs change. And, and my fear is that when we talk about how fast everything is changing, we ignore the kind of foundations, right? So somebody made the observation that we gotta get math skills up, right? Math skills are math skills. We need to define them. We gotta figure out the rigors. So talk a little about, you know, I would imagine um, a trade credential certification isn't train, changing all that significantly in terms of what's there, whereas a cyber certificate is probably dramatically changing. So how do states think about this issue? Some of the core stuff is just the bread and butter work of credentials, whereas some of the emerging stuff might be kind of emerging a little quicker. Talk a little about the kind of the both ends of that. Well, if, if the certification is accredited, there's a mandate for an accredited certification to have an ongoing systematic uh, process for updating knowledge to show validity of that exam. Okay. And unlike uh, if you got a degree in 1985 and then you got a degree in 2017, the outcomes or learning outcomes, competencies, whatever they will call them, uh, is probably a little different. Uh, certifications, if they have those initials after their name, it is assumed that everybody has been updated to have the same competencies because of the recertification requirement. So when there is a change in the competencies initially to enter into having a certification, then the people who are already certified have to become uh, equal to that by putting that in the recertification program so that even though they got their certification in 1985, it will be the same as the one in 2017 that has gotten their certification. So that is a unique uh, difference uh, in regard to many other types of credentials. Certification is a lifelong type credential. Okay. I don't know. Do you have anything else? So, so Ali, we've we've just heard a lot of the um, exploding heads, convoluted <laughs> nature of this. The fact that a lot of different entities in in states own it. Uh, I would even add the the a lot of disagreement within the private sector in terms of if you ask a whole bunch of health industry experts, let's figure out what that credential is. They may or may not come to the same term. I think the associations play a, an aggregating role in many industries, but we don't have that in all fields. So talk a little about some of the experiences you're seeing and working with either in, with states, uh, employers and others to help solve, some, maybe not, maybe improve the opportunities here and take advantage of those credentials and certifications. Sure, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> it, it is complicated. I'd like to first, thank you very much for inviting somebody with um, my sort of experience to participate in this panel. Oftentimes in my role, we're sp speaking to the SHEO offices, so the secretaries of education or the departments of higher education. And more and more, we're, we're in rooms like this where there are people from 
um, industry, governor's offices, legislators. And that to me is really encouraging because like Roy and Christine said, this topic is really complex. And there are a lot of what have been silos in states that are beginning to get broken down. And I think that those conversations, crossing sec the cross-sector conversations are really important for us to make any headway in this at all. Um, if post-sec just talks to post-sec and K-12 just talks to K-12 and workforce development just talks to workforce development, we are gonna get uh, what we saw earlier that we can't have, which is more of the same. Um, our, uh, the national and state level data all show that we more of the same is not going to work because the same hasn't worked to get us where we need to be. And that is why we are having these conversations at all. So first I want to back up a little bit and, and just, well, one, admit that I'm going to approach this from a highly post-secondary view. So I just want to address my biases up front. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons that um, some of these silos are starting to be broken down in the States. Um, years ago, we looked at our graduation rates from colleges and universities, and those were low. They hover somewhere, if you take all the different types of colleges and universities that receive Title IV funding into account, they hover somewhere around 50%, which is not great. Um, then at the same time, some international comparison statistics were released that showed that we, at, in terms of educational attainment, the United States was lagging behind. So we started with these conversations about, well, we need to up our completion numbers, right? And that was largely degrees and certificates that were awarded by post-secondary education institutions. At the same time, you still had employers, and I am preaching to the choir in this room a little bit, but at the same time, you had employers that said, hey, this is great. You're giving us people with bachelor's degrees and associate's degrees, but guess what? They still can't do the work. I don't have the skills available to me that I need to have in order to serve whatever population it is that I'm serving through my, through my workforce. And so then there were more conversations around, okay, well, how do we increase educational um, competitiveness and economic competitive, competitiveness globally? And in the post-sec world, you have all of these foundations uh, led largely by Lumina Foundation working to increase educational attainment. But we're not, we're, that's, that can't operate in a silo, and I think there are a lot of states that are starting to recognize that. Oklahoma is one of those that are, um, uh, has re received an attainment challenge grant from Lumina Foundation. And as part of that grant, um, which in this state is managed actually by Oklahoma Works, so not the post-secondary office, but the workforce um, partner. Um, and, and so for those grants, you have to bring together a cross-sector agency to talk about how are we going to increase attainment and include not just degrees and certificates as we've always included, but also other credentials of value. And what are those other credentials and how do we know that we're seeing them in their high quality? So I think the governors were up here earlier talking about um, you know, we're far ahead and we're, we've at least started the conversation. And I think that's right. I think um, Oklahoma and South Dakota both have taken a really good first few steps towards, you know, solving some of these problems of how do we get, how do we increase our economic competitiveness by including all the voices that need to be included in the conversations around what credentials of value are. So with that out of the way, I'm just gonna take a couple seconds mm -hmm. to talk about a couple states. Um, so, uh, like I said, there had been this sort of singular focus when we talk about college in the United States, largely because of the people who are talking about college. I assume we all have a college, this is actually a big assumption on my part, but when you walk into rooms like this, often most people have a college degree. So when they think about college or post-secondary education, by and large, we're thinking about traditional four-year uh, college experiences. And more and more we're starting to say that's not true. Um, in fact, the traditional four-year college institution isn't even the largest proportion of post-secondary institutions. You have institutions that are less than two-year that award a lot of the certificates that um, lead to some of the certifications that we're talking about up here. Uh, community colleges, the two-year institution population, obviously is a huge and important part of workforce development. And then you, you do, you do still have some people coming from high school going straight to college. Um, the, the, 
The thing that we need to realize is that defining and measuring some of these um, non-traditional populations is really hard and is, is a new thing. In New Jersey and Florida um, in particular, I think we have somebody from New Jersey in the room. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so New Jersey and Florida are both working at this. I think we have someone from Florida too. Um, they're, they're both uh, working on these initiatives to define credentials of value that include conversations with people from workforce and the industry and processes for bringing together stakeholder groups to talk about what the workforce needs are and what credentials from um, what are often referred to as non-traditional providers or alternative providers, what those look like, and, and um, really defining them in terms of what the states need. Um, the, I, I cannot emphasize enough, so um, my, my dark past is that I was a statistician at the Department of Education, um, but I, I really can't, can't emphasize enough the importance of data and knowing what you're looking for. And so there are a few initiatives out there. Um, there's uh, Launch My Career, which has been adopted by Colorado, Tennessee, Virginia's working on a version. Rhode Island. And um, it's uh, Rhode, Island, Rhode Island, I think, is, is new. And there's, there's one more state that I can't remember. But this is a tool that provides um, information to students that takes into account not only what the programs are that are available to them, but also their post-collegiate outcomes. So you can look, you can go on to Launch My Career Colorado, for example, and you can plug in, I want to be a, um, a pirate. And what will come up are the programs that are relevant to your career choice and also some estimates about how much that will cost you and how long that will take you to make, make up your, your um, cost of education. Um, the National Center for for the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems (NCHMS). I almost never use their full name, so it doesn't always come off uh, that smoothly. But NCHMS has been working on this tool that analyzes at a regional level for states like Georgia and um, New Mexico was part of it at one point, and Kentucky. At a regional level, what are the workforce needs, and what is the supply coming from higher education institutions, including all of the different providers providers that, that submit data. The National Skills Coalition has been working with a handful of states on their SWEEP project, which again get, brings together um, cross-sector uh, groups to think about supply and demand of credentials and jobs in the state. So those conversations are all really important. In addition, states are starting to look at some of the policies and practices that may prevent people that need to go back and get re-educated from returning. So for example, um, before I start, if you've seen one state, you've seen one state. So we, I, will, I will stay high level, but for example, there are financial aid programs in a lot of states that exclude anybody who's not fresh out of high school. And so states are thinking about ways to overcome that. For example, in Indiana, there's the adult learner grant, which is specifically for people re-engaging in their education. Um, states are looking more at alternative delivery. So we heard the word competency up here a lot. And this is something that is really, really uh, important to me. Um, Competency-based education is sort of a new old method for thinking about education. And that is instead of arranging um, education and the resulting degree or certificate in terms of if you complete 120 credits, I'm going to give you a bachelor's degree. Instead, there's a list that says, prove to me you know and can do the things on this list before I'll tell you, you, you can have a bachelor's degree from the University of Oklahoma. And states are looking at ways to support that. And then there's various things like apprenticeships. Um, states are, are thinking a lot more about how to integrate those into post-secondary education. And also integrating the different programs that are available, like WIOA in, into state aid programs. And, and working more with employers to really push employer Correct. tuition benefits and things. Great. So we're starting to hear this the little clarity around what are the issues that underpin good credentials? What do we need to pay attention to? Some examples from a few states. I want to just ask a question to any of the three of you, but it's this notion of as kind of from the private sector, the public sector leaders, we often talk about credentials of value. How do we help students, parents, and employers value 
those credentials that are valuable? Because again, we're working on a cultural issue. We heard this in the last session of how do we make these things, you know, if, if anybody is, has kids in here, is your kid going to get a credential or a four-year degree? Most people will say, I want my child to get a four-year degree. So how do we help people understand as, as either the student, the parent, or the employer value that credential that's starting to come online? Uh, I think Cuba Gooding Jr. said it best when he said, show me the money. Um, showing people the cost of their education versus the post-collegiate outcomes, or a smarter way of saying that is ROI, is really effective, but it has to be done clearly, concisely, and in a very engaging way. So you can't just throw up an Excel table. You've got to use something like Launch My Career to let okay. students interact. And Christine, before you, so, so one just kind of a, uh, caveat. So a number of states you mentioned are doing launch my career. Um, and really what it's trying to do is put an ROI on a degree. So before we kind of think that that's a, such a straightforward, I'd be interested to know, and just thinking about your BA, your undergraduate degree, how many people are in the job that's aligned to their undergraduate degree? <laughs> what was your undergraduate degree? Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's always some smart aleck in the room, you know? All right, so so we're getting, I don't know, maybe 10%, 15%, but how about your, we'll give you the advantage, your, your graduate degree in line with what you're doing? Oh, raise a hand. I want to, okay. All right, so I'm a little more confident. That, but, but I say this because sometimes, we jump to these solutions where we say, if we could just put an ROI on the degree, we will knock out those degrees that have nothing to do with the career or we'll start to see some patterns. So it's with the friendly advice of, let's not be too uh, structured on how we think about this because for a lot of people, what college represents is that you can persevere, that you can do a team project, that you can collaborate, that you can focus on something over a length of period of time because for many employers, that's a skill set they need. They'll train the technical. But I just I say this because sometimes you'll hear a lot of language around the launch my career where we put politics into the black and white of, well, this degree isn't worth it. Let's not fund it in our state. And so it's just it's one more data point that's out there. So can I just add the second note? Uh, I would strongly advise that ROI tools are not used in the way that you just said. The ROI is not strong, so let's not fund this. And the best example I can come up with is early childhood education. We need those people, continue to fund those programs, and let's figure out how to get them paid better, I guess. But, but the, you know, you've got to take the context in the state. Yeah. I, me, me, I'm sorry, um, I cut off Christine. I'm, oh, I'm, yeah, I, sorry. I no. sorry. Yeah, Richard saw my hand go. He's like, oh, I'm going to get worried. <laughs> so I, I'm so glad you brought up ROI, because this is, is something that, I'm asked about a lot when I help an organization develop a certification program. They say, when are we going to recoup our ROI? And I, I like to present it more as an ROA, a return on assets. And I like to, because it's more than dollars and cents, you know, for the very reasons that you said, yes, get that person in early childhood paid. Those people are absolutely essential. And when you look at it, I, I like to talk about value and benefits in both tangible and intangible ways. So the tangible benefit or the concrete value is going to be, I got a job over somebody else because I was certified in audiovisual or as a food handler. Um, I got a job as a food handler because I had to get this certification in order to get this job because it's a requirement. It's in regulation. Um, I got a promotion. I advanced in my career. I now have those, you know, letters and initials after my name that tells me that I'm on the same team as you. What I happen to be doing, I couldn't go to school for because it didn't exist, but I have something of value that says I am an equal team player in part of this. It also, when you're looking at the intangible benefits, it's things like um, the organization that sponsors or develops this actually owns a body of knowledge. And from that body of knowledge can build. And from it, they can build the opportunities for continuous 
ongoing lifelong learning that people who are certified have to show. Remember, we talked about maintaining competence, but that uh, people want. People really, really want this. They want to continue to learn. They create a nice repository for people to go to. They build value, they build reputation, and then they can start gather this, gathering this interesting thing, data, mm -hmm. data, data, yeah. data. When you have a captive audience of people certified in a job to do a particular job, you can tap their shoulders directly and start getting good data that goes back and shows them how their um, their field or their profession is advancing and how it's going. So yeah. when someone asks me about ROI, I say I can never answer that question. Let's talk about assets instead. Yeah. So are you going to come back to this issue of how do we help students and parents think about valuing these things? Because too often we we all just default to a, I want a four year degree. Right. Uh, I about a year and a half ago, two years, I served on the panel of the Academy of uh, Sciences. Uh, and the you know the strongest predictor about success with uh, undergraduate education is student engagement equal to content uh, because it has to do with the engagement inside the classroom and the engagement outside the classroom and it's those relationships that determine success uh, in the in the workplace as much as the content does. Certainly you need uh, 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 both. I always say that in order to determine the valued credential, it has to be quality. And quality, unfortunately, is in the eye of the beholder. So it's hard to grasp a lot of times. I could go through this audience and I'm sure we would get many definitions of what quality is uh, to you. But it's quality, market value, and effectiveness. We're involved in work cred in a study with manufacturing. And one of the beginning things that we're starting to see is that there are a lot of credentials for manufacturing, but most of the manufacturers say they're not very effective uh, in the workplace. And guess who is the uh, the one that is probably getting the worst result that is the manufacturers with 25 employees or under. One of the mainstreams of manufacturing in this country. We are not providing them with the tools that they need for a multitasking uh, uh, person. Many of the big certifications have to do with large corporations such as Siemens or uh, General Electric or, or some of this. We've forgotten the little guy uh, in regard that produces products and processes uh, for us uh, in this country. Um, Lumina uh, is about to, I was involved in one of their uh, task force in uh, an initiative called Connecting Credentials. And um, the, what the group that I was involved in is how do you de develop trust of a credential? And they have come up with three variables, quality, transparency, and evidence are the three components. Uh, and so that'll be coming out in the next month or two uh, uh, for people uh, uh, to look at uh, in, in, in that regard. So uh, I, I think helping uh, uh, parents and students is also, we heard this morning about awareness. Uh, you know, how do you find out about these credentials and where is the national database that is going to do it, which leads me to um, a project that I have been involved in with my life for the last three years. And, uh, and I have to give credit to Lumina Foundation. They are the ones that had the vision to fund something under a grant called Transparency Credential Initiative. And it was a grant to build and pilot a national credentialing registry that would house all credentials. And again, when I use the word credential, we're going to talk about degrees uh, uh, to, to, to badges for this uh, thing. And this initiative, uh, Credential Engine, and I'll tell you how we got there in 30 seconds, is a basis of a year of is it feasible to develop this was the first minor grant that we got from Lumina. And then it was led, by the way, by George Washington University Institute of Public Policy and Southern Illinois University, who is doing the technical platform uh, 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 for this. 
and it had business and it had employers and it had and the answer to that year-long feasibility study let's try it let's not do another concept paper let's just try to build it and see what the problems are for the two and a half years transparency uh, initiative uh, we started building it business roundtable decided that it was important to move this from a research study to just having it. And so the grant was cut short uh, and uh, Lumina Foundation uh, helped create something what we now call Credential Engine, which is a 501c3 organization. It has a board of directors. It has advisory, and this is important, advisory committees of business and employers advisory uh, uh, from experts in certification licensure, advisory from people on third party uh, uh, entities that we call quality assurance entities, which it may be state approving agencies, it would be accreditors in higher ed, creditors in the credentialing uh, world, anybody that determines quality of a credential, that's that advisory. And then uh, uh, fourthly, of course, higher education, although we want it to be education maybe in the future because we really need K through 12 in there as well uh, uh, in this regard. So those are the advisory uh, and, and what, what it's designed to do, that's just saying that uh, it's everything. Because of this language problem, it was decided that one of the most important things that the National Credentialing Registry, and frankly, it will be global because it's in the um, uh, up in the cloud, uh, uh, and eventually, when it, we're ready, this is a national focus right now, uh, just for the United States. But we have EU and everybody else saying we want to connect to it uh, to make it uh, more of a global. But right now, it's national. So the first was to develop credential transparency descriptive language. So whether you say you produce a degree or whether you produce a certification or whether you produce a certificate, either with an association or inside higher education, that you will describe it in the same language. And that's another lecture into mm. itself, going into what the language is. But it is designed for parents, for students to be able to look and compare and identify what's in it. Because there are about 25 descriptors to include what can you do with this. So it's just not just the quality of the credential, but it's looking at the market value of the credential. Do employers require it or prefer it? Uh, and it does have the salary uh, stuff in it. Were employers engaged in developing this credential? If so, what was the extent of the employer? So it's a wide range of profiling. And so we think that this transparency, because the whole idea about the credential engine is transparency of credentials. What's in them so we can make some judgments about whether we think they're good. Also, the HR people, which they think this is going to be terrific uh, because when they review resumes and they don't know half of the credentials that are put on resumes these days, they are going to be able to go to the credential engine registry and identify what is this thing all about or is it even there and is it recognized by a third party? This is the other uh, element. Uh, 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 to this sort of thing. So the common language, uh, looking at the transparency of the credential, and then, as you know, there's a lot of discussion, especially those of you in higher education, that the people who are determining quality these days are under question as to whether they really are looking at the right things or not in determining quality. So because of that, Credential Engine also is asking the accreditors, the approvers, the endorsers to put their transparency uh, uh, processes on so that if someone says such and such accredited that, we'll say, well, what was their accreditation process all about? How did they develop the standards to determine quality? So it's credential issuer and it's credential uh, uh, quality assurance approver. Then the other aspect to this is 
not only HR, but we think school and career counselors, they say that they do not have a one-stop shopping to be able to go and look. I see some nodding heads, so this is good. Uh, we were with the state of Maryland and they also agreed that this is desperately uh, needed and there would be certain apps because the registry is agnostic as such because they want people to put their credentials on and not be hindered by a lot of you have to have this, this, and this, or you can't put your credential on. We want more transparency about credentials so that apps can determine quality based on the stakeholder in what they're looking at in this regard. So, so let me stop you there. I want to, yeah. I want to, this is one of those cases of if you build it, Will, will they come? It, will they come or will <laughs> it be valuable? So so here's a question to how many employers, private sector uh, individuals are in the room? All right. So I want you to put your, you may not be HR, but just thinking about your, your private sector. If somebody comes to you and says, I have a credential, and you can look here, are you going to look at are, are you going to accept it? Are you going to want the four-year degree? What's the, give me a sense of what's, what you think your company's reaction would be to a credential that is below a BA, four-year degree. Yes, uh, can we, let's get a mic over to you. And please just identify who you are and who your company is. Unless it's something really negative, then just say it's Boeing. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. I wouldn't do that to Steve Hendrickson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Chuck Gray with Frontier Electronics Systems. Yep. Uh, we build uh, sub-assemblies for uh, space flight, uh, aeronautics, maritime systems. So if somebody comes to us with, with one credential, one uh, certificate, let's say it's in soldering, we'd say, that's great. But we look for a collage of credentials because not only does that individual need to be able to do that specific technical task, he needs to communicate with those around him so that when he finishes his task, that the person that gets that particular product next understands what they completed and what they're supposed to do. Great. We also look for uh, an attitude. What's your attitude? Are you focused on yourself or are you focused on the success of the company and more important, the success of our customer? Great, thank so, you. So uh, that's what we look All at. All right, that's helpful. Anybody else just observation from in the back right here? I just wanted to point out that uh, we build a lot of credentials in our business. So that's, we're in the business of creating credentialing programs and many of them require an underlying, underlying degree. So, uh, you know, we're currently working with an organization that's, you know, made up of geophysicists. Most of them have PhDs, but they're still creating a credential. So just the fact that it's a credential doesn't necessarily mean there isn't a, a degree underlying it. And then I think, I think for most people, uh, HR directors, for, for example, I think most of them be, do become familiar with the credentials that are known and have value in the industry. Of course, things like Credential Engine, I think, will, will be a, a useful resource to that. And Roy, I believe, uh, I believe even the, uh, the, the metadata structure uh, corresponds to the uh, HR uh, uh, data uh, format. So uh, I think so. I'm, so, but I want to come back and push it. So, part of the issue, right? So, think about and and I want to bring public sector employers in here, right? State government hires a lot of people. Is most jobs will say, I want a four year degree, BA plus. I want a X. I, I'm trying to explore this issue on the. We can build an engine that starts to have the transparency. We can have the ability so that. South Dakota doesn't have to build their own credentials and Montana right next door is building something similar. And, you know, at some point we can cross state line and, and solve some of those issues. But I want to push this idea of will employers start to 
reimagine what their job description looks like start to think about it in terms of competencies or in terms of a credentials that are less than a four year, right? Is that observations on that? Either public or private employer? I don't, I'm, yes. Let's, can we get a microphone right here? I, I think that's a great question and I'll, I'll just share with you an example John, of some. Who are you, John? Oh, I'm sorry, John Sack. Uh, Deputy Commissioner of Higher Education for Montana. Um, in Montana, we've spent a lot of time on this particular topic and, and we, we linked into the governor's uh, Main Street Montana initiative, which has set up uh, key industry networks for various, various industries across the state. And so doing that, we connected in with um, key businesses, uh, we use the process called a DACUM analysis, develop a curriculum analysis, so that we were, we spent a lot of time deconstructing uh, various curricula, and I'll give you a couple of examples in in advanced manufacturing, for for example, and we also did did the same in healthcare, but taking a look at uh, what what does industry value, what do they want included in the curriculum, and and the industry and in, in the in the from the perspective of advanced manufacturing, wanted us to use the NCCER um, uh, credentialing system. Uh, and and uh, we also used uh, AWS for welding. And since we're so close to Canada, we used uh, the Canadian Welding Board. So we, we blew up the curricula in those programs and then reconstructed it using those credentialing um, uh, systems so that the students could could have uh, stack credentials leading up to an associate of applied science degree or if they continued on to a bachelor's degree and and so we're, we've been doing the same thing in in healthcare and and we've just finished a major reconstruction of all of our nursing programs from licensed practical nursing to associate okay. degree in nursing all the way up to BSN so okay. All right. Other observations, and and it, it's interesting, you know, for longest time we talk about stackable credentials. I actually love your term about a collage of credentials because what we're talking about is no one has an isolated job that all I have to do is move this widget. It is about some of those fundamental and foundational skills of how do I collaborate? How do Roy and I, who may talk different languages uh, in terms of technology, can interact so that the product and the customer gets what they want. So interesting. Yeah, it should be noted that with this technology, which the World Wide Web Consortium has been working night and day to make it the latest and the greatest uh, type of thing, is that it can search on data. So even if they, if no one knew anything about credentials, if they say, "Tell me the credentials that have this skill bundle." it would bring up all the credentials that they may not have heard of. Something that in aerospace, there might be uh, something in healthcare uh, that relates to that uh, skill bundle. So it's crossing industries for the first time and looking at the uh, various. And I should mention, since the Commissioner of Labor from New Jersey is here, uh, who just signed on to do a state initiative because states are beginning to say, gee, we should have a more complete system and letting people in our state understand all the opportunities and credentialing that would be available that. Uh, Indiana is the other state that have signed on in the pilot to help us begin looking about how this can be done at a state level or regional level, not just a, a national uh, level also. Sorry, keep hitting it. So before I open it up to questions from the audience, the last question to the three of you is, is really this, so what can states do, right? So you're talking about the uh, credentialing organizations, you're talking about foundation that's trying to build these bridges, but from a, whether you're sitting in a CTE program, a four-year institution, two-year institution, your governor of a state, your department of, secretary of labor, uh, or K-12, one or two suggestions that you would make that a state could make progress on to move this notion of credentials forward. And let me just go the reverse of how we started the opening comments. 
So one is continuing to perpetuate these cross-sector conversations, making sure that you draw in industry, do exactly what's going on with Main Street Montana, have people involved in the process of putting curriculum and programs together. The second one, and this goes back to a question you asked, was around how do you talk students and their families into knowing about these credentials of value? So keep working on that translation and communication piece. Uh, I, I would say incorporate the whole concept of credentialing into education so that, you know, a, a student could go from um, you know, graduating from high school saying, you know, when I get through my degree or I, I get working somewhere, I know I want to attain this certification. I want to meet the requirements to be that welder who's going to be able to, or the person working in aerospace to be able to do that job, to build on that awareness for students, and as you said, Ali, for their families. Um, and if you can, um, if there is a particular gap that you are trying to fill in your state, um, see if you can get the funding to create a model. So one of the things that the Department of Energy did, um, they were looking for consistency and comparability and skill sets across four energy jobs. So energy manager, energy auditor, building commissioning professional, building operations professional. And um, they, the Department of Energy actually funded and we actually built um, the whole foundation for the certification, the entire package of competencies, what you have to do to qualify to get in, what you have to do to recertify, to maintain the credential, and built four entire, we call them schemes, um, that any certification body can license like for nothing, um, not from the Department of Energy because they're clearly not in the business of assessment, but through a nonprofit that acts as an intermediary. And if you can fund that, then people will be going to those jobs. You will have comparable and consistent workers doing the job you want them to do. In their case, they wanted an increase in um, energy savings and they wanted safety because there were a lot of mistakes that were occurring. Um, so if, if at all possible, if you can fund a model, I think that would be great. Right. Okay. Roy? A couple of things. Um, one, give I, you one, then we're going to put it out to question. Okay. Sorry. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. In, okay. Give me give two. two. Give me two. One, Cause uh, this one's important, uh, is to bring credentialing down to the high school level. Uh, secondary. Uh, there's a lot of things they can do, and industry will work with you, but they don't think of it either. So we need a closer relation. The second uh, uh, is, um, and this will be the moose on the table and a little controversial, we have to look at state licensure. And are the scopes of practice really reflecting current practice? And do we need to break down the boundaries? This won't be easy because like I pointed in my little diagram, the professions are very powerful and they have a lot to protect. And so uh, we've got to move beyond that and not see, because licensure can be a good thing, but on Unfortunately, on a national level, licensure is being branded as not so good because it's preventing mobility and all and scopes of practice of allowing uh, people to, as the nurses would say, practice at their highest level. That's right. my two. Excellent. So just and and so think about questions you have, but two observations as this builds on, right? When Ali talks about the communications, think about the language we use, right? Is Oftentimes we use shorthands, ISO 9000, ANSI, you go through this and quickly all of our eyes are spinning backwards when we start to use the shorthand that we use. So one observation is when we are marketing out to parents and students, we shouldn't be doing it. Hire someone that has a credential that can market, that'd be one. <laughs> Two is um, just on your point about licensure, oftentimes in state government, we give the provider the capability to license. Right? So for all of you in education, I will tell you, it's either the State Department of Education or the higher ed institution that can grant licensure. So we're giving the provider the ability to say that, that their product is good. Some states are starting to shift that licensure capability to the recipient of the graduate. Right? Pilot in Massachusetts was you were letting, they were doing a, a principal training program instead of having the 
higher ed institution knighting this person with licensure. They were saying to the school districts, you have the ability to grant licensure. Just shifting who has that capability scares the crap out of people. But we need to be thinking about how do we reinforce quality. So with that, questions from the audience, and if you have one, so let's start. Well, actually, you started the last one, Bill. So let me see if anybody else wants to jump in. Question, observations, while you think about it, Bill. Hi, it was a great panel. <clears throat> My question concerns what's going on internationally. Uh, so in the first panel, we talked about internships, importance of work-based learning. You know, in Switzerland, two out of three high school kids go into an apprenticeship program. We're you know, light years away from that. What do you see happening? I know the EU has been involved in a very ambitious effort to create standards and credentials there. The goal was to facilitate labor movement. So if you couldn't get a job in Italy, you could go to uh, Portugal or you could go to uh, Denmark or whatever and, and, and use those skills there. How, how do, what do you see happening internationally in terms of development of these um, credentials? You're underselling, you have two, to, two out of three students in Switzerland have it. We have two or three students in every high school has it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, uh, uh, I, I think I mentioned that the EU is already asking about Credential Engine and how they could interface um, for two reasons, I think. One, uh, certainly understanding what credentials are, uh, are available in the United States for uh, probably immigration uh, purposes, but secondly, uh, demonstrating that they have credentials that people may want to get uh, that might go across uh, uh, borders also. So I, I see that there is more and more dialogue among countries to begin talking about the purpose. The um, ANSI uh, ISO, the ISO standard that, uh, that ANSI uses to accredit certifications, I spent the last five years when I was still with ANSI uh, developing a multilateral recognition arrangement among countries so that if ANSI accredits somebody that uh, a certification, then those countries who are part of the MLA, they would recognize that quality. Uh, and there are about 25 countries that will probably initially participate uh, in that MLA. So we are beginning to see people like ISO, which is generally about products and, and processes versus people. Uh, but we're seeing them saying the mobility of people globally is becoming more and more important, and there's no reason why these certifications shouldn't be recognized so that gives people other opportunities in this regard. Questions? Yes, sir. Tom Robbins, I'm the Deputy Secretary of Energy here in the state of Oklahoma. Um, I think I echo kind of Roy your comment about um, certifications. Uh, we have a lot of boards, agencies, and commissions. Those naturally are made up of many times predominantly people directly associated with that industry. I know here in our state, the governor has tasked uh, and asked our Secretary of Labor, Melissa Houston, who's a statewide elected official, and she's leading a task force. And the step one in talking with her when she was debriefing me is that, is that they're just trying to create a database, quite simply, of everything that's available so that somebody who's a citizen or interested in a profession or doesn't know, because right now we don't even have a comprehensive statewide da database that you can look into. And I think as we look towards the future, what you'll see is that you won't have a one-size-fits-all. She gave an example of an IT software company that designed something that they were marketing to um, uh, car dealers around locks, you know, something about electronically being able to unlock and, and do different things. The locksmith group got a hold of this and said, hey, wait a second, we need to be able to license that. And they said, sure, where do we need to go? What test do we need to take? And they said, Oh, you'll have to take our test, which includes understanding how to crack a, a, a you know a lock from you know the 1800s or something. Right. Of course, you know they they. <laughs> so the labor commissioner disallowed that you know rule, and she goes, "They haven't talked to me since." But I think uh, I think the point is is that with IT solutions, you'll get people who don't need a full license, right. but they'll have some sort of solution expertise or problem or need to be able to engage in a certain specific area, and they it'll be too daunting for them to say, I need to spend the next four to five years of my life 
uh, for example, going through this whole process where I just need this part. It'll have to be in some ways an a la carte model that'll acquiesce to some IT development would be what I think. I, um, you brought up a, a, an interesting fact. There are over 4,000 agencies, maybe close to 5,000 now, that say they certify people to do something. It is a buyer beware uh, environment uh, because probably only 10% of, the, of that 4,000 is recognized by any third party. And so 90% of them haven't been reviewed by anybody. It's what generally the professional society said they want versus what is needed. And I think that's one of the issues that we have that we've got to corral that a little bit more. But you also hit a really important point I think people need to pay attention to is sometimes those that have the credential don't want it to be expanded. And you'll notice this a lot in the healthcare field. And, and just to tie credentialing to cost of healthcare, a lot of doctor uh, associations will prevent nurse practitioners from doing certain things because they're not licensed for it. So paying attention to what license creates the opportunity to do, as well as what it restricts people from doing, may have cost implications for other social sector uh, issues. And uh, the new opportunities in healthcare, many times the professionals will tell you differently, but community health worker, patient navigator isn't necessarily one professional specific. It has to do with the competencies that one would have, like community health work, culture, understanding uh, uh, the neighborhood and how, where they have resources uh, to work at. So there's a lot of opportunities in healthcare as it changes to community-based and home healthcare. It's a different type of individual and two major healthcare systems. We think that healthcare pretty much is on top of it. Two major health systems have told me that the universities really aren't producing uh, all the competencies they need, that they're still lagging in their thinking about what healthcare is versus what they've got to deal with uh, in their particular regions. Another question. Uh, Chuck Gray again. Uh, one question about small business. Since 62% of the jobs in the U.S. are generated by small business, what initiatives are taking place to integrate the small business criteria into the credentialing process, and how is it working? Well, I, uh, most of the initiatives that I'm aware of don't. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, the research, our research is with the Manufacturing Extension Partnership of NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And one of the recommendations that we hope to have is uh, what the credentialing for the future should be for the small manufacturers, 25 or less, or 50 and less. I'm not sure where it'll break out. Um, but right now, uh, the little guy isn't being paid attention to. Uh, maybe other people know of other initiatives. But. So I think um, it's, it's a good question and an important voice. You, you do see some uh, initiatives at the institutional level. So colleges will reach out to the small businesses right in their local area and work with them to develop curriculum that can produce for them the skills that they need in, in terms of their graduates. So you, you, it's, it's a lot harder to do that at scale, though, if you're going to get all the small businesses in a room. That's a big room. So um, I think people are starting to pay more and more attention, but the local levels is really where that, those conversations are happening. Other observations, questions? So I want to, if, if not, I'll give you a second to think about it, but I want to push um, a little further on, on more actions that state actors can take, either state actors or, or employers, because th this notion of um, credentials, if we talk about it, and Roy, you said at the beginning, some paraphrasing this is, credentials are really the cur currency for readiness around specific skills and competencies, right? If we can think about that, then it's really this conversation of, how do we define those skills and competencies that are most valuable for a specific 
set of skills, or maybe for the small employee, it's probably a wide range of, you gotta be a master of multiple things because there's fewer people to do the specific. So how do we think about some specific tangible steps that state leaders can take, um, either in the education industry or in government, that can start to move this conversation forward? So I'll get pretty state specific. Uh, in Indiana, so this, this whole notion, I spent a lot of time working on competency-based education as a way to help um, re-engage adults, but also help better serve students that have not been served by our traditional higher education systems. And to give employers a little more um, faith in the, the people that are graduating from our colleges. So I worked recently with Indiana, and in their current strategic plan, plan, which we were developing at the time, they have a whole section on competency and thinking about competency what are the competencies that we need as a state to be able to say that some uh, one of the, our Hoosiers has an associate degree or a bachelor's degree? They have a general um, education transfer core. It's gone through different names. So if you go and it has a slightly different name, I apologize, um, but, uh, that is competency-based. So it identifies the skills that at a basic level, anybody who's been educated in, in Indiana will have, and that core can transfer to all of their institutions. Um, and, and I think, so I think that that part's important, but I also think that the, um, the uh, commissioner of education and the, the governor's office are pushing these conversations is a really important piece. Um, and also in that state, the, um, the Chamber of Commerce has a very close working relationship with the, um, and the, and the, the business roundtable. They all have a very close working relationship with the Higher Education Commission. And so those conversations are happening and happening naturally, and they're being pushed to the forefront as something that we as a state need to think about as important. Okay. That's the reason Indiana is participating in Credential Engine because of that competency. And I failed to mention, I hope. There's probably somebody in the audience from J.P. Morgan Chase. J.C. Morgan Chase is also funding uh, Credential Engine along with Lumina now, uh, with this, uh, also the verbal support of BRT and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Actually, they're they're all lining uh, up uh, uh, in in this regard. But I think I think that uh, also. Uh, another group that is uh, making, trying, thinking about making the decision is the military, about being more transparent with their particular credentials and how they could bridge to state programs uh, and try to make that network a little more because there are like 250,000 type of, of service men and women who are coming out each year uh, from the military that is an asset that if we are more competency-based, we will be able to bridge uh, these credentials more and the states uh, could actively be developing these types of programs to bring more talent uh, into their state uh, in this regard. And um, we, uh, there was a very interesting statistic the other day. Only 4% of the society now has had any relationship with the military in this country now. So most people do not understand the highly technical competency-based education that the military uh, gives, which the states are missing out on by not looking and, and drilling down to that of who's coming into their state and how they can develop bridge for immediate assets to their businesses. Okay. Christine, any? Um, thank you. Um, I, I think, I hope that at the end of these 90 minutes, you're a lot more familiar with credentialing and with certification and, and how it can really serve people at many levels um, in your states. And to understand that certification really it, it's it's non-denominational. It's non-secular. It, it it's built on on a on a foundation that shows these are the competencies that you can show to to remind yourselves to reinforce that to get that message out that it's not you know one particular um, you know um, profession's interest although it is the point is if it's developed correctly and used correctly that you've got 
um, the same expectation from everybody who earns that credential for how they work and the competencies that they will bring and the skills that they will bring um, to, to a particular field or to a particular profession. And to really try to learn about that, to really try to engage with that, because I think it's a very useful resource for you. The work has already been done. You don't have to repeat the work, so tap into it. Okay. So before we um, ask you to join me in thanking the panel, I just a couple observations just to draw up from this session, right? As you heard in a number of different ways this idea around competency-based education. And typically, it's a notion of defining a set of skills or competencies that people can demonstrate they've mastered, and then you give them a degree, a credential, or a badge. And if you're not paying attention to it, either in the K-12 or post-sec or even the workforce training space, it's one of those areas that you need to be thinking about because it's where the industry is moving because it's getting more tangible about what are we, what are we guaranteeing that you have learned? Right? So if the clearer we get, whether it's K-12 around standards, we've defined what students should know and be able to do. We're trying to make the high school diploma meaningful because we're putting a set of competencies and skills behind it. Same thing in workplace. So it's one of those areas that becomes important. Two is a, another resource and, and um, that you may want to be aware of is so, again, the link to Indiana. So Purdue University and Gallup, the polling industry, created a, a program around trying to survey alumni of, of uh, education institutions to figure out what were the most valuable attributes through their education that made them effective in the workforce. And in many ways, it's the kind of the common uh, foundational skills that there was perseverance, there was working in teams, there was a collaboration, there was a cross kind of skill set of being able to communicate with people that don't have the same skills you do. And it's one of those um, initiatives, um, former Governor Mitch Daniels had, is leading this at, at Purdue with Gallup. And it's just one of those areas that you may want to be paying attention to as far as, again, beyond just the technical, what are the broader set of skills that people need to be successful in the workforce? Um, and the, the last thing I'd say is um, we cannot underestimate the, you know, if we build it, will they come mentality is we need to be paying attention to will employers operate and in a sense change their job description, their hiring practices. Will parents and students start to buy into this notion that maybe I don't need a four year degree, but I need a degree or a credential or a certificate that's meaningful in my area that I'm going to be working. So all of these things, and I think what my colleagues have helped try to do is define some of the problems and start to lay forth some of the initiatives that are working forward around these credentials. And I think that along with the earlier conversation around how do we help students understand where the careers that are most, the opportunities in my state, in my community, and what's the educational trajectory I need to get there to be successful. And what my colleagues have done then is how do we start to think about then putting a credential behind that. Now, where that leads to is a system that send, then starts to ask the question, do we have the resources to build it, which will be the next panel. So before we move to that, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.